and gentlemen, Graham Holm here, aka Australia's Original Money Mentor, and it's an absolute pleasure as always each week to introduce you to the brilliant Dr. Andrew Wilson. I won't cover off his credentials. Uh, most of you by now should know who he is and the amount of weight, his accreditations and his experience. He's definitely well-versed as a talking head in the industry and his, uh, his knowledge, his degrees, his accreditation cover all of that. So let's not muck around. Well, good morning, everyone. And here we are again for the Wilson Weekly. And today being the first of the month with Doc Wilson and Graham Home, original money mentor. Good morning, Doc. Yeah, pinch and a punch, Graham. It's uh, we're into March. You know, it's, uh, it's is, is that pinch and a punch coming from the RBA or the bank's profits as rates are climbing? Or it yeah, feels well, like we're getting pinched and punched in every direction. Yeah, I think the Reserve Bank's a, a target for those that sort of activity, metaphorically. But mm. the big day, of course, is next week with their second meeting of the year. Um, we had the minutes released from. Uh, from their first meeting of the year, which of course occurred uh, three weekends ago or three weeks ago, um, and I must admit, just reading the minutes of that, uh, the full minutes of the meeting, Graham, um, what really uh, uh, you know sort of shook me a bit was just that they're so uncertain about the outlook. You know, and I mean, I know you can't expect them to be absolute crystal ball mm. uh, gazers, but uh, they were really saying essentially, well. We don't know. <laughs> you know, it's it could go this way, it could go that way. They they you know constantly referred to the fact that there were risks to any position that you took in terms of the outlook for interest rates and the so economy. We so we can't think that they're just gonna go, oh, let's just go up half a point and get over get it over with, or let's pause, or let's they're, they're really a bit bipolar in their decision making process, or many they don't really know which direction to go. I guess. We just That's keep right. going up and see if it works. That's the, what the textbook says. Yeah, well, I think this is the problem that the textbooks are, are wrong. Um, <laughs> they have been wrong, um, and uh, they weren't wrong. They were wrong when they were telling us that we should cut interest rates to fuel demand. It didn't work. That was pre-COVID. And now they're wrong when they're telling us to increase interest rates to deflate the economy. So... Uh, you know, at the margin, perhaps it's made some difference, but not, you know, controlling the cycle, which is what monetary policy is supposed to do. Maybe we need that song. Who sings Let It Be? <laughs> <laughs> well, Graham, you know, I, I tell you what, there's uh, some argument to say, you know, a more stable monetary policy might give us more stable outcomes in terms of the business cycle. But, uh, you know, that's a theory and, and it has perhaps some holes in it. But it certainly this is the main point, Graham. We are now, uh, May was when we first increased interest rates in this cycle. Mm. Now, we've had uh, uh, nine increases, consecutive increases every month. We've had an increase in interest rates since May, with the exception, of course, of January when they don't meet because they're down the beach. But um, uh, here we are. You know, and and what's happened? Well, you know, there's been some, you know, he easing, some hesitation perhaps, particularly in housing markets, but the, the economy is still rocking along on eight cylinders, uh, you know, and now which we'll look at the latest data for February for house prices, hot off the press, mm -hmm. is showing us that uh, prices are starting to rise again, particularly in the Melbourne market, uh, sorry, the Sydney market, which led uh, led the charge downwards last year is now you know moving higher. Um, so what's happened with higher interest rates quelling demand? We've now got housing market. We've talked about this before, Doc. Most people don't have debt or a lot of debt. I know people get on here and go, ah, wow, he's me. look. A majority of Australian households don't have debt at all or substantial debt. They are very manageable debt levels for. Probably 80, 75% of homes. Yeah, that's right, Graham. And the other point is that um, we had the wages data released last week, which was actually a little disappointing um, in terms, and, and again, and, and we're not here to bag the Reserve Bank, but they are, after all, our, you know, the policy makers for us, you know, in terms of setting interest rates, which are so important. But they've also got it wrong again on wage increases. The wage increase... Uh, increases that we had over the year to the December quarter, and we'll look at the data shortly, 
uh, we're, we're actually quite disappointing. You know, we're not really seeing a big lift in wages that we would have expected with this very strong economy and lack of labour. Um, in, in fact, you know, we're still well below where we were 10 years ago when we had a, a similar strong economic uh, period with the with the mining boom. So um, the problem with that is that, you know, if you're not, if your wages aren't rising as, as fast as prices are, mm. you know, eventually that's going to cause some issues. But nonetheless, wages still did increase by 3.3% over the past year. And many others, I would suggest, had higher wage increases. And that does help to offset those increased imposts from higher interest rates. Mm. But uh, there, there can be no doubt, and we also had retail sales data out, which was released just yesterday uh, for January, and, and a few are sort of saying, oh, yeah, that's a, that's not as good as it should be, um, and uh, it's a sign that interest rates are starting to work. But, you know, really the data, while maybe a little disappointing, is still so far ahead of where it was pre-COVID uh, that it's you know ridiculous to start saying it looks like the economy's tanking, uh, and it's well ahead of where it was a year ago uh, before we had interest rate increases. So you know uh, clearly, and the minutes from the Reserve Bank reflect this, is that we are in this sort of no man's land of not knowing what's going to happen, and maybe with the Reserve Bank other than just having to stick to the plan, um, you know, not really having a lot of confidence in how this is going to pan out, you know, uh, particularly over the short to medium term. Mm. It's uh, it's definitely getting tough. Like I said, Doc, those wage inflation or the wage growth figures, stuff is way more expensive and that, that wages yeah. increase hasn't caught up. So it's not that we're ignoring that it's definitely tougher for Aussie families out yeah. there. But the economy just keeps plow. If it's not even an eight cylinder. It's like a twin turbo V eight. Like this thing's a supercar, supercharged. Yeah. Uh, now you're right, Graham. And and the point is that inflation is currently um, running at nearly eight percent headline inflation. Inflation in the high sevens, and we only have wages increase at, at, in the sort of low three. So that's leaving us a gap of four percent. Mm. Uh, so telling us that actually real wages are falling by around about four percent. Now we still have. Uh, reasonably high levels of savings. Um, you know, we still have, we still feel pretty good about where our house prices are now compared to where they were a couple of years ago. Uh, there's a lot of opportunities out there still with, uh, you know, with strong labour market. Uh, and, and really, we just haven't seen any significant signs anyway, maybe some very early signs that higher interest rates are starting to impact the economy. But at the end of the day, you can't argue with the fact that this economy is still supercharged. It's still very, very strong. And, um, and Doc, before we jump into the data, pros and cons. I mean, Australia compared to the rest of the world, we're a young nation. You know, we, 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 we got found a bit later on, so to speak, as far as an economy and, you know, coming into the world. What are the pros and cons here? Before we jump into the data, we go, booming economy. Is that disastrous for us long term? Is it positive for us long term? Are we having the growth we finally deserve or need? Well, for the average person, what does it mean? Well, I, I, Graham, clearly we want a booming economy. If we can control inflation, if we can complete, if we can have uh, supply and demand matching themselves reasonably. Um, you know, that's a positive thing because. The offset to that, and that's what the Reserve Bank is attempting to do, is to quell uh, economic demand. But, um, you know, the externalities from that, the problems from that, the problems we get from that is putting people out of work. Um, yeah, I mean, is it so bad to have a booming economy? Is it so bad that people can still afford their mortgages or their rents and can still afford to be spending in retail spending? And is it all that bad to have a bit of growth and to have a bustling economy? Uh, no way. And it's uh, as I said, we need to be able to control inflation. But I, I think the conversation will move towards, well, really, politically, socially, can we do what we've done in the past and crack the economy to control inflation? You know, mm -hmm. the Reserve Bank governor horrifically mentioned a 9% unemployment rate a couple well, of weeks well, ago. Well, I actually ran with that clickbait for us last week, Doc. We said 9% unemployment or 9% interest rates 
or is everybody confused as all hell at the verbal diarrhea? Because you uh, said yourself, journalists heard 9% inflation or unemployment, sorry, and then started quoting 9% interest rates. Well, you know, um, if we look at the unemployment issue, Graham, there would that would be, you know, I, I'm not sure governments could actually sell well, that this well, is another recession we had to have sort of thing. And this is uh, an interesting thing. Look, this is back to textbooks, right? Okay, booming economy. Put rates up. Yeah. Not working. Let's crunch the economy. Really pump rates up. Make yeah. lending laws tight. Okay, now we've got 10%, 8% of people out of a job. People lose homes. They yes. lose businesses. Yeah. They lose lives. You know, they, Ex- exactly. Lives are lost in these times. Yeah. Is that really the textbook answer ongoing? Is the is the multi-million dollar, billion dollar question of, hey, maybe that's not the answer anymore. I agree, Graham, and that's the problem. I'm not sure that uh, you know that we have the appetite to be able to accept uh, that we have to have a steep economic downturn to to quell inflation. Um, you know, I mean, you know what's crazy too. Every time we have that economic downturn and lives and businesses and livelihood, you know what happens straight after that downturn? Yeah, we get a boom. We get a boom. So it's like. Why can't we just manage and, and, yeah, and bubble? Right. Oh, anyway. And this is the big question about monetary policy, Graham, which has clearly failed us since the GFC. Mm. It's failing us again now. Uh, it failed us when we were trying to pick up our economies. Uh, it's failing us again now. And, uh, you know, we, we've just got to think through the square here. And even if it's just a matter of saying, well, look, maybe we've just got to live with higher inflation a little bit longer and we have to have uh, not just a target for inflation, but we have to have a target for unemployment as well. And that it's all right to say, well, we've got a two to three percent inflation target. Well, if that comes at the cost of a ten percent unemployment rate, well, I'm afraid that's not acceptable. It's not going to work. Um, and, and and you know, it's uh, it's all very well for these uh, policy mandarins to move from you know position to position and and then wash their hands of the consequences of. Uh, as you mentioned, the dreadful consequences of cracking an economy. Mm. Um, but that's not, you know, that's that's no answer for those that do lose livelihoods, uh, have their, you know, really their their whole careers put on hold or even crashed um, because of, you know, uh, policy making that reflects, you know, something of decades ago. And we've got to understand the last time we were in this position was really in the early 90s. And, um you know, it took us 10 years really to recover from that. And as you said, Graham, lives were actually lost through that period, through the decimation of of, of people's, you know, uh, careers, of their livelihoods, of marriages ending, you know, yeah. terrible times. Now, I, I, I'm not sure that the, you know, current generation since then no, uh, I don't think we'll cop that. There will, there'll be a riot in the streets. I don't think they've got the grit to put up with that and, uh Governments will be turfed out on their asses faster than you can say lickety split, I think. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Lickety split, don't come back. But yeah. I said, no, I've seen it. I think they're now coming out and saying, hang on. And I've been waiting for a COVID tax. We've got it, we paid it forward. We've got a there's got to be a COVID tax coming soon. I mean, we had the NDIS, right? We had the levies introduced to help with the NDIS scheme years ago. The government loves a new tax when we're running in a deficit. I'm finding they've now come out and they're talking about super going, oh, hang yeah. on a minute, 15%. No, 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 it should be 30. And it's like, well, how the hell, where, where do you get a break to get ahead? It was super, you know, you got a break to be able to be independent and self-funded. Now they go, oh, hang on a minute, we could have a crack at this here. We could claw something back and maybe add another 15% tax to super. Yeah, it's sounding like the old tax the rich mantra coming from the left of society here, Graham. I thought yep. perhaps the Labor Party had modernised itself a little bit more than getting sucked into the class warfare argument, but mm. no. Well, that's why I keep hearing that one person in Australia has $400 million in a super fund. It's like, sure, they bought shares in Facebase or Apple Book or whatever at one cent and they're worth a gazillion dollars each now. It's quite unique. but um, But I just think... Where do we get a break? Like you, you introduce something, and and I mean, Kerry Packer said it really well too. It's like you change these laws, and people just start to grasp it, and they start executing something, That's right. and then you repeal that and introduce a new one and a new one. So, like, what can you actually follow through a generation to be able to retire comfortably? Pretty scary. 
Well, that's right, and and that's the whole essence of superannuation, which was you know a um, a positive initiative from the Hawke Keating era, and um, you know it was about taking the burden from the taxpayer by mm. relieving you know the need for pensions when you retire, you know to be able to fund yourself in retirement. Um, but governments, not just the Labor governments, have been chipping away at uh, that big superannuation pot of gold um, to increase their own bottom lines. And here we have it again. And no surprise that the Labor parties, you know, although I am a bit surprised, I thought they would have matured a bit, you know, more than getting sucked into the class warfare argument. Um, at the end of the day, we are an aspirational society. If 80,000 plus are fortunate enough to have 3 million dollars plus in their super accounts. Well, good luck to them. As you said, who yeah. knows uh, what the process has been to accumulate that sort of wealth. Um, but to be targeting, you know, as I said, the uh, the top end uh, smacks of that, uh, you know, class warfare type of, type of ideology, which uh, I, I'm not sure middle Australia are going to buy into that. So, you know. Well, I mean, middle Australia really aspires to be top of Australia, right? So. Yeah. That's right. uh, you know, th- like so that class warfare hasn't. I mean, I get it because things are dearer, inflation's high, rates are high, times are tough. So probably good timing to grab people who are a bit pissed off and start a class warfare. But I think we're a bit too awake for that these days. Yeah, particularly given how strong our economy is, Graham. Everybody's yeah. doing pretty well uh, notionally, and uh, I think really these sort of. Uh, you know, left-wing policies or tinged left policies should be left to the the far left, which of course is the you know the green end of the spectrum. You know, to come out with those sort of scenarios, and you know, we other than perhaps with a uh, a minority government, I'm not sure the Greens are, are going to have much you know uh, mm. potential of uh, getting some of their policies through. Though you never know, but uh, mm. yeah, certainly it's as I said, particularly in a booming environment. I'm not sure the aspirationals. Uh, will be, uh, you know, buying into the, you know, let's tax the rich type argument, yeah. which, uh, you know, is the Labor Party doesn't seem to be able to rid themselves of that type of, you know, addiction yeah. in terms of policy positions. But anyway, we'll see. We'll see. Well, let's have a look at the data, Doc, because, uh, I mean, you got some short, sharp, very matter-of-fact data this week for everybody. So let's have a look at the data. Yes, Graham. Well, we have some uh, interesting data. We've already discussed it to some degree. Um, and uh, as we've mentioned, uh, we continue to mention the economy is still booming. Um, I did. Uh, we did discuss uh, retail sales there briefly. Um, retail sales, this is the January data for retail sales. Um, we can see there was an uplift around about a 1.4% increase in seasonally adjusted retail sales over January compared to December. There was a, a sharp decline in December, but as we've discussed previously, Graham, uh, a lot of that was because of the change in seasonality uh, as a response to a lot more retail activity in November. And of course, that's all about Black Friday mm. and those Black Friday sales. So I guess we could say November is the new December and December is the new November, if I could <laughs> put it that way. Uh, so it's sort of adjusted its way out. Uh, having a stronger November and a weaker December, so we can sort of put that to one side. Um, but uh, and it bounced back, perhaps not as strongly as we would have anticipated on the trend, Graham. And some commentators have been saying, "Well, this is a sign the trend is down slightly on what it was prior to November, that surge in November." Um, but um, and nonetheless, when we compare it to January last year, Graham, we're well ahead of that target. And look how of that result we had a year ago and look at where we are now compared to where we were uh, before COVID, you know, um, retail sales tend to grow incrementally or had until COVID and then they went through the roof and they're still very, very strong. Um, But nonetheless, yeah, perhaps some early signs that interest rates are having an impact, but I think we need a few more quarters to, uh, or a few more months of data on retail sales to make a uh, to call on that. It is very early days. Retail sales are still strong, and I don't think there's any sign there that they will act to offset what is likely to be another interest rate increase next week, Graham. Um, so wages, we also alluded to wages growth, Graham. 
Uh, Wait, a little disappointing, 3.3% annual growth over the December quarter. Um, It certainly didn't keep up with the level that we had over the September quarter um, and still well below where we were in 2010. So it's sort of a good news, bad news story, Graeme, because um, where uh, if we had have had... uh, it's bad news because its its wages are not rising as, as as fast as inflation. So we're getting real wage falls because let's remember inflation is now well over seven percent, but wages are rising by just over three percent. So there's a four percent gap there plus. However, what it does show us is that we're not at this stage on the official data bidding up our wages to very significant levels, which would only fuel inflation because a surge in wages would be. Uh, taken by employers as uh, a reason for them to increase prices further to cover those increased wage costs, which again would then activate uh, more wage demands. Now, just putting it in perspective, Graham, wage increases in the UK and the US are tracking well over double what they are in Australia. So in the UK and the US, they're paying themselves a lot more. Wage earners are earning a lot more in response to that high inflation which unfortunately is working its way into higher or certainly, uh, you know, inflation that's look, that's not showing any significant falls. Now, we're, we're not in that trap um, to this point. So uh, it's a good news, bad news story. Bad news because it means real wages are falling. But the good news is that we're not looking to move into those higher levels of wage increases that the UK and the US are experiencing which is clearly working its way into making inflation a bit more. Now, and that look, that's good news for small business owners, obviously, yes. because if they're already struggling, I mean, I know employees might be as well, but we can't have our SMEs and our whole small business framework crash in Australia. It's the backbone of of the employers and taxpayers. So yeah, it's and, a bit of a, it's it's yeah, it's a bit and, hard. Uh, it's horse before the cart, cart horse. It's it's not hard. Well, it's the, the pain is being felt by real wage falls, but at least the wages are there, Graham. Yeah, uh, and I guess the incentives there to earn more in an economy where we have a shortage of labour and uh, certainly plenty of work around at the moment. So, um, uh, but again, it reflects the positive nature of our wage setting system in this country, which is different yeah. to the US and the UK, whereby we have those annual or two yearly wage reviews still. Um, and we have enterprise bargaining still, although there's noises coming out of the Labor Party to change that. Again, you know, perhaps some warning signs going off there because, as I said, compared to UK and the US, this is a better inflation-related result at this point, um, although it does mean that real wages are falling. So it's a conundrum, yes, Um but, uh, you know, it's it's part of this process of trying to in control inflation. So uh, we mentioned how strong the economy. I thought this was interesting, Graham. This is the capital city data, which has just been released for uh, unemployment. And um, uh, we can see there that uh, unemployment rates, despite a year of higher uh, interest rates, are still lower than um, in, in all the capital cities over January compared to January last year. Of course, we know the unemployment rate nationally, seasonally adjusted, ticked up by uh, 0.2% over January. Uh, again, some very early signs that higher interest rates may be working. Um, but again, we need a few more months uh, to be able to be more confident about that type of assertion. But um, I think the interesting thing here, Graham, which will relate to uh, when we look at the house price data, is the latest house price data is just how strong that Sydney uh, labour market is. Mm. It's got clearly the lowest unemployment rate over January. And these aren't seasonally adjusted figures, Graham. So obviously January is a holiday month. Uh, we always have higher unemployment in January uh, in the absolute numbers, not the seasonally adjusted numbers. But to still have a 3.5% unemployment rate during January in Sydney, I think is a record low for January yeah. employment rate for Sydney. And I think that's the clear catalyst of why the Sydney housing market has picked itself up off the bottom is that, uh, you know, the, the local economy is uh, is blazing away at the moment. Okay. Well, if the economy is blazing away, then, Doctor, without uh, letting the cat out of the bag, yeah. 
Let's let Probably it out. The uh, Sydney housing market must be starting to recover. Yeah, well, let's let the cat out of the bag, Graham. Here we go. <laughs> so uh, housing markets have improved in 2023 um, and the Sydney market is now rising uh, for the first time since March last year, Graham. So um, oh, no. after, uh, you know, 10 months of falling prices, Sydney prices actually increased over the uh, over the over Feb- over the February quarter compared to the January quarter, and if we look at the national house price, because Sydney makes up a, such a, a significant proportion of the national house price, as we always explain, is a weighted average based on the number of properties in each of the capitals. Uh, the national house price it also uh, increased for the first time since April last year, Graham. Um, wow. So- yeah, so national house prices, the headline now, Graham, is national house prices rising. And, of course, that'll work its way into the narrative. And oh, dear, oh, dear, Doc. We've been saying this for years now that there's been, what, 1987, we've just had our fourth instance yeah, of yeah. a slight correction, yeah. and after every little correction, yeah. there is substantial growth, and the growth is at a rate faster than the decline we just had. And the remarkable thing, Graham, is that we've got this growth uh, now, and we had an interest rate increase three weeks ago, yeah. right? And we've had an interest rate increase every month since May, well, and yet we're back to growth. Now, if, as we, if we go back, Doc, this time last year's podcast, or you know, we would you would uh, we quite frequently use the term. We do not think this correction is as deep. Nah. Or as Ooh. steep as everybody's predicted. We said that for months and months on end using your data. And here well, we are. Well, here we are, Graham. And of course, the you know, the elephant is that in the room is, you know, just how high interest rates will go. That will always be a negative for the housing market because it yeah. just means you've got to pay more for your mortgage. But in a very, very strong economy, we are continuing to see offsets for those increased interest rate costs. And here we are. Again, prices are rising. Now, this is very much about the Sydney market, the national price rise over February. Um, So, so, you know, early days. But uh, a rise is a rise is a rise, Graham. You know, you can only only just look at the numbers there. Hang hang on. How how does the clickbait report that? Well, it's maybe the, you know, the, uh, the, the blue sky before the storm. I noticed one commentator uh, who's been uh, predicting and he, uh, a commentator in the national media, national publication, who's been once again, he's got a history of this, has been you know predicting crashing house prices for the best part of the past year, has now said, yeah, well, I'm wrong, but I'm only wrong because this is a pause and it's going to happen soon. But you watch. <laughs> so, you know, that's the I'd big- love to be right. I'd love to be wrong 999,000 times, but just hopefully be right once. Well, that's the theory of the doomsayer. It's like, okay, it didn't happen now, but it'll happen tomorrow. And you can keep saying that for a thousand years, can't you? Yeah. Uh, and, and all you're doing is saying, well, wait for tomorrow. So that's <laughs> fine. It's a cheap headline. Uh, you do look silly, I suppose, at the end of the day, and you die being wrong. So, okay. <laughs> uh, you know, but. Uh, the problem is that those that buy into that argument and make investment decisions or home buying decisions based on that, you know, they're the big losers really over this, sure. listening to that sort of gobbledygook. Well, yeah. so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, here is the data. We've yeah. had an increase. In the increase. Price. And as I said, Graham, this is very much about a weighted average. So it's, it's more instructive to look at what, what's happening uh, on a capital city basis. So without going through everything in detail here, we can see the Sydney housing market actually increased by 1.4% over the February quarter compared to the January quarter. Uh, We also saw a modest rise in Adelaide, which was basically flat, uh, Perth up as well. Uh, Modest decline again in Melbourne and Brisbane. Um, But uh, those declines in those larger capitals, uh, Melbourne and Brisbane, uh, were actually lower than the declines over the January quarter. So the trend is still positive there. Um, so, you know, uh, the, the first swallow of spring perhaps or summer or whatever it is, is the sign that we've finally bottomed out perhaps in our national housing market. Um, and we can look at the- Doc, um, Hobart, it's been a big performer over the last few years. Big, big performer. Well, it's, it, again, I think what the, the point to this is what's interesting, Graham, is that the Sydney market typically leads 
the market down, and that's what we saw lead, lead markets down last year after a very strong 2021 period, um, and then other markets have followed the Sydney market, yep. and now typically the Sydney market leads the capital city markets okay. upwards as well, um, and perhaps we'll see that over coming months. Oh, no. uh, it would least... be silly to think that there's a pretty predictive pattern here over time with the data, Doc. I mean, it's always going to be bad. <laughs> you know, but I, I think the, the point of this is that we see the national house price up by 0.2 of a percent, but really we've only had three capitals where prices have increased. But the impact of the Sydney market is clear there for all to see because Sydney has a high proportion or takes a higher proportion uh, of the number of national listings or number of national uh, homes uh, or houses, and therefore it contributes at a significant uh, rate to the national house price. So that's why the national house price really doesn't tell us much. We've got to be looking at, because of the weighted average scenario, we've really got to look at what's happening at a local basis there. And you can, on a local basis, you can see that prices are still lower uh, uh, everywhere except Adelaide and um, uh, Perth. Perth still performing strongly, grown 9%, uh, 6% over the past year. But the rate of declines in Melbourne and Sydney are now clearly easing. Uh, if we remember, the January data showed us that uh, uh, Sydney was down 9%, over 9% uh, the year to January, and, and Melbourne was down uh, around 7% on the year to January. Well, well, those annual declines are now easing, Graham, and that's what we would expect as markets start to uh, reach the bottom. But we're more interested, obviously, in the latest data, and the latest data is showing us uh, that it's a very positive uh, report for Sydney, particularly for um, for houses up by 1.4%. Uh, similar result in units, Graham. Um, we also saw the first rise in the median unit price, national median unit price over the February quarter uh, since May last year. Of course, we know units have been outperforming houses. Uh, they peaked later and didn't fall as much as houses are, but the national unit price also increased over February, uh, and again, we can see that it was, uh, well, Sydney was had an increase, but Brisbane is clearly the big mover in uh, national unit prices, Graham, up by 1.7%. Brisbane unit prices have now increased by 9.6% over the year. Now, you can see Hobart there, which had a very big increase over that February quarter and has risen sharply over the year, but the Hobart market is for units grain is very, very small. Yeah. Uh, there's only a, a small amount of units that go, get that, into the that, market in Hobart. That figure that, sways very quickly from a couple of big sales. Exactly. So it tends to be quite volatile. But the markets with substantial activity, uh, are certainly with Sydney up, Brisbane up, Melbourne down um, again, but just by 0.7%. But, but clearly, Graham, the standout there is the Brisbane unit market with a very strong result over February, starting off the year, uh, certainly uh, with uh, positive results. And unit prices in Brisbane, Graham, are still up by nearly 10% over the year, uh, which, you know, of the major capitals is a, is a standout with Sydney. Uh, it's easing again, still down by 4.9% over the year, but that's an improvement over January. And, and Melbourne, similar results, uh, still down by 8% over the year. But I, I think that Brisbane market is a complete standout for units, Graham, particularly given, you know, the issues with higher interest rates to be seeing uh, units, uh, median house, median unit prices rising again there. So for all our uh, viewers, um, there's a, uh, a QR code for the full report. You're welcome to uh, take a picture of that one. Now, and if you're on, uh, you'll if you're get on Spotify or Apple Play, or you're in the car right now, you need to jump on the YouTube. Yeah, that's you right. You need to see all the slides. And Doc's very kindly started including a QR code to his home price report. So and we'll have YouTube, it. it's in the show notes. And um, we'll be having more data available for the podcast too, Graham, Ooh. as, a, as a, uh, I guess to provide more insights into the economy and particularly the housing market and recognising that we have uh, a, a number of our stakeholders are interested not just in the major capitals, but also in the minor capitals and our regional centres. And my housing market uh, has data that covers the whole of Australia. So we'll be providing some very interesting data models to our viewers. 
uh, in coming podcasts, Graham. So that's Thank you for exciting. that, Doc. So ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. Doc has had a chat with me and he's going to start producing regionals and subs and majors and minors. So all the data you need. And I mean, even just to be a bit cheeky, Doc, I know this week you beat Core Logic out with your data. You well, came out first. Yeah, well, we shouldn't talk about that. But if you're in Sydney, <laughs> uh, I hope you grabbed the Channel 9 story, uh, which was uh, speculating on the bottom of the market. And uh, we're, of course, uh, privileged to be part of that. And our data was also part of that uh, Channel 9 story. So uh, uh, look out for that one as well. But as usual, Graham, we'll finish off with our auction market report. Um, and again, you know, we've been spot on with our predictions from auction markets. Auction markets are a clear uh, forward indicator of what's happening generally in our housing markets. We always show this, uh, this particular model, which is uh, instructive because higher clearance rates mean higher uh, house prices. And we've seen that in Sydney and we see that in Melbourne as well as examples. And uh, what a weekend last weekend. Another big weekend, Graham. Uh, this has really set a lot of the doomsayers back uh, to some degree. Another 75% clearance rate in Sydney, despite 100 more auctions in the market. These are wow. quite healthy numbers. They're not uh, significantly low. Uh, Melbourne. Uh, lower numbers. Yeah, Melbourne over 70%, its best result in nearly a year, Graham. Uh, and, and what, 300 more properties up for auction? 300 still? more properties. So. You know, some choice, lots of choices there for buyers. Of course, the numbers aren't as high as where they were a year no. ago because a year ago we were at the back end of the boom and we had to get out of jail stakes. A lot of vendors were trying to get into the market before the boom ended. Um, so we had a lot of activity. But these numbers are around about what we would expect uh, normally for this time of the year if we weren't in a boom or a decline. So uh, still quite healthy numbers and, and they will continue to grow, Graham. Um, and but the market's just shrugging off these numbers. Uh, you know, I, I think that there's been some you know chat with the a lot of the self-appointed commentators that uh, it's low listing numbers that are putting upward pressure on prices. Well, you know, uh, these numbers aren't what you'd regard as being low. They're lower right. compared to last year. But last year we had extraordinary numbers of properties in the market, particularly and auction pent up, and, and pent up demand, demand flowing through. So. Yeah, and, and the other point to those big numbers last year, Graham, was that they were coming through after the lockdown period. So it was all about the vendors, the sellers uh, and the buyers, but the sellers who were restricted from activity in markets because of lockdown. And that was also a significant reason why we had such record numbers of properties coming into the market. But those that speculate are two-dimensional that this is a listings versus uh you know, by an argument to that sense, uh, are ignoring really and not looking deep enough into the data. But, uh, you know, we've we've seen house prices increasing in Sydney and unit prices increasing also. Um, and uh, in Sydney, we know it's the first increases um, since early last year. And we're seeing these clearance rates, which are now getting very close, Graham, to where they were a year ago. So once again, the auction market is supporting the price, uh, the price data generally, uh, and as I said, that another strong result for Sydney, uh, best result in Melbourne for nearly a year. Uh, Brisbane around about where it was the weekend before, but quite a reasonable result there for Brisbane, which had also a big lift in listings, similar listings in Adelaide. But Adelaide keeps tracking around that ninety percent clearance rate. It's a very strong auction market, Graham. Australia's strongest auction market, and a big rise in Canberra listings, Graham. Um, a 50% increase in Canberra listings and its in, it clearance rate uh, was higher as well, but it is the underperformer currently, the Canberra market, um, and it has been moving a little bit sideways over recent months, but uh, some signs there that it might start to pick up. But we always see the Canberra market follow the Sydney market, and I think that we may see that uh, that continue going on. So this is just the trend of our auction clearance rates, as you can see. Now only below in Sydney where they were in February last year, so it's a, a big recovery there. And why we should be surprised? Why should we be surprised that prices are rising? Uh, Melbourne also uh, the highest results since April last year. Auction clearance rates. Uh, Brisbane picking up compared to where it was at the end of last year. Mm. Uh, similarly, Adelaide still very strong with eighty percent clearance rates, 
and uh, and Canberra just starting to work its way back into positive territory as well. Uh, also, it's interesting, we showed last week the auction price movements and no surprise, Sydney again, its auction prices last weekend are tracking higher than where they were a year ago. So again, another validation, even though the other markets, uh, with the exception of Adelaide, are lower, um, the Sydney market is now producing auction prices at the highest level for a year. And these are week to week, Graham, so they can tend to be volatile. But I thought it was interesting to put that one in again as well. And if you want those auction clearance rates, get onto my LinkedIn uh, or continue to watch the podcasts. Uh, our LinkedIn uh, Saturday night, we have the snapshot report and uh, Sunday mornings, we have the full national report. So, Graham, that's it for me. Um, uh, another week goes by. Another very interesting week. Um, we've certainly had the uh, uh, the great news, perhaps for homeowners in Sydney, that prices are now starting to feel their way into positive territory. Uh, so we await the latest results. And next week, Graham, and I know you will be breathless with anticipation for most of the next seven days. We'll have the rent report for February. So we well, can- I actually, I actually am a little bit anxious slash excited because. There's a rental crisis. There's a housing crisis. And no matter how much we put rates up, it's a basic human need. So, you know, investors obviously have to put rent up to be able to provide a roof over a family's yeah. head. Tenants have to pay what they have to pay to put a roof over their family's head. So it's a bit of a bit of a spiral at the moment, Doc, but I am actually a little bit restless waiting for that data. So I'm a bit excited, scared, but excited. So it'll be good to to see what's happening. And where where the where things are at the moment. So stay tuned for that, everyone. Next um, week. And if you're on the podcast, make sure you jump on YouTube or check the show notes. Uh, the QR code was there with Doc in that presentation, and we've got a lot of other data that Doc's going to start popping a QR code in for. So, and uh, we're live again this weekend, Doc in Sydney. So look forward to seeing you in the flesh again. Yes, great news, Graham. And uh, you know we are at the market, which is the Point of conversation at the moment, having absolutely you know, having perhaps reached the bottom of its downturn and back into growth, back in black. Absolutely, looking forward to seeing how it tracks over the next couple of weeks. And we'll be yeah talking about the regions a bit in a bit more depth on Sunday too, Graham. So yeah, good stuff, excellent. Thanks, Doc. See you later, Graham.